great uh good good afternoon or good evening or actually i can see we've got people in the uk so we've got good morning as well um so welcome everyone um so we have we've we've got two groups here uh from the fintech association we've got corey and jessica from the digital banking group and payments group and then somewhere although my screen's now full with all the people uh i think we've got stefan and um and maybe somebody else from the um from the future foundations and we're very privileged to have adam darcy join us who not only has been um heavily involved and instrumental in payments initiatives uh both here and in indonesia uh, but also, and what he's going to share tonight, which I think should be uh, really interesting, is using jobs to be done as a tool for creating world-class uh, customer experiences. Um, Corey, Jessica, anything else you'd like to add, or are you happy, happy we get going? Happy to get going. Just a big thank you for Adam for setting aside the time and looking forward to the conversation. Great. Um, so... Adam, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, where do we find you this evening? Um, Vietnam. Vietnam. Lockdown in Vietnam, trying to get back to the UK to do a big move. And yeah, because I thought you were heading to a new role. In fact, haven't you just started a new role? Yeah, I, I, I'm, there's a jobs based in London, but I've had to start remotely. It's a, a company called Prodigy Finance. They, um, they basically help um, help people in emerging markets who want to do a master's in top schools in the US and Europe, basically get that funding. You know, if you want to go to Harvard and do an MBA, the banks won't lend you money in, in um, you know, as India or South Africa, because, you know, they're just not used to those size of requests. Um, and you need collateral and things. So, so what they do is they help that funding gap, they plug that funding gap. And, um, um, so, so, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I suppose to start, I suppose to be back on the 1st of September, but I just couldn't get out. I mean, there's so many things blocking us right now. This Delta is running wild across Southeast Asia, which, you know. And, um, um, but yeah, fingers crossed next Thursday, I'm flying. So let's uh, pray okay. for me, please. Yeah, <laughs> fingers crossed you'll end up uh, back in Blighty. And, but you've been, <laughs> and let me just share a screen because you've, you've been on a little journey. I was privileged enough to work with you and benefit from your experience uh, in Indonesia with, with actually at the time, probably one of the world's largest messaging systems uh bbm where we put um put payments social payments inside there um obviously you know, a lot of people know pay me those in hong kong and people know gojek um but tell us a little bit about um indo cassie and maybe and then a little bit about mapan which people may be less familiar with yeah sure um so yeah a company called monetize brought me out to indonesia to work on with uh, we were partnered with blackberry um messenger to build kind of a money app um and indo cassie was kind of a side project because uh, there was a bit of a love i think um was it you remember this was, was blackberry trying to launch their new os at the time or there was a bit Correct. of a lull in my activity and, and i had a bit, bunch of free time and and um so so i basically uh, you know in the evenings and weekends i i i built a um, kind of a crowdfunding um, platform <clears throat> i learned a lot about social networks in Black, blackberry messenger it was fascinating actually to see People just get up in the morning and just connect at 6 a.m. Like tens of millions of people just connect the minute they wake up. It's, it's kind of triggers all these kind of thoughts about why, what is that human behavior there? So I read a bunch of books and like behavior evolution and, and things. And then, then I had an idea that um, I wonder if, uh, you know, in, in, there's no kind of just giving. If you know this website in the UK where you can run marathons and people can donate to you, that doesn't exist in Indonesia, but you're actually the number one giving country in the world because it's Muslim and you have to give X percent of your your um, salary a month um, uh, as part of the culture so so anyway all these things together i created this platform um, in my free time and um, yeah it became pretty big we, we raised loads of money for charities like 250,000 us and all through these micro donations of friends donating to other friends who were, who were running around and um and we got to learn a bit more about the payment infrastructure as well because collecting donations is really really hard when you've pretty much got a cash ecosystem um, and people do pledges and then they have to go to the atm and you know so so you learn a little bit about product and psychology, about how to nudge people to donate if they pledge, like follow through with the donation. So I think the most interesting thing was um, we did an experiment where we sent an email every three days to the donator and said, hey, come on, go to the ATM, transfer the money, here's, here's the code. 
and um, you know we got like a twenty percent uplift or something. And then what we did is we CC'd the friend they donated to, and let's try that as an experiment, and just to get those eyes in there, and then it went up like eighty percent. <laughs> so th those little things that kind of gave me the that kind of as we went towards Hong Kong and pay me. That's what really kind of well, wow. This can be really powerful if you understand social behavior and you know the, the motivation um, to keep up appearances, and that can be a really great thing to build into your product to get to make it more successful. These these little behavioral nudges. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I think we'll we'll talk much more. You'll you'll hopefully give us some insight into Pay Me, which I think yeah, like I say, most people are familiar with. Uh, for those that are maybe not, um, it's. It's frankly, it was the only uh, new initiative uh, last year that HSBC talked about globally. So it's it's actually been super successful here in terms of social payment and then expanding out, um, and record record numbers of you know rate of growth. And I think it's up to two point five million now, and heavy penetration into the target groups, the millennials. We'll come back to that. What about Mapan, which you moved to? I'm not sure if people will be as familiar with with Mapan. Yeah, this is um, this is a really interesting business, and, and I, I, I bet no one's heard of it uh, outside of Indonesia. But basically, after this was after pay me actually, I wanted to go into impact, uh, social impact a bit more because I really enjoyed my time in Indocasi. Uh, so, um, and this so Mapan had just been bought by Gojek. This kind of um, is it Decacorn? Is that the right term? Like a ten yes. million dollar free IPO. Um, ride hailing and, and um, what Marpan was, it was uh, 250,000 female housewives in the villages in Java and Bali across Indonesia. And they had basically had an app, like a transactional app. And there were these, there's already behavior in the market where, where women would come together every month and bring, it used to be rice, but now it's money. Like I'll bring like $5 and then someone collects it and you have a bit of a lottery and someone wins all the money. And you take it in terms of if there's 10 of you, there's 10 months and you'll win just once. And what it's about is just getting like a spike. So when it was rice, you could take 10x rice and put it in the granary or whatever it's called. But with money, it's the same thing, right? We never get this income's very flat. You know, it, it, it spikes, but it's tiny. So it gives you that big spike to be able to go and buy something big. So what Marpan did, it took that existing behavior. Um, and then it looked at what products they were buying on finance. So they were, you know, they had like money lenders in the village because banks don't go to the villages lending because there's no data. And people were buying things like their first fridge, their first bed, like, you know, people were sleeping on the floor like the first time they've had a bed before. And they were using money lenders who were charging them like 100% interest if they, you know, like payday kind of loan style. And they were paying around 20% more for the product as well, because it had to be shipped from the city to the village, which, you know, it's like 220% more than we would pay. So we, um, so, well, what Marpan did is they, they attached this kind of savings club model to the purchase of these items and they procured all the items and had a catalog. And these agents would then go and bring this kind of savings model to purchase items to the villages. And, and basically they could buy it, at, you know, the same value someone in the city could buy it, same quality. And they paid zero interest because it was savings, it wasn't lending. And, and they made money on the margin of the goods. And so, you know, it's more like an Amazon model where you're taking a percentage and obviously then you get into white label. So, so what I did there is that coming in, you know, first of all, upgrading the product and tech teams. But the biggest thing was actually like, again, this is where Jobs to Be Gun comes in, just, just interviewing all the customers, you know, these agents. And straight away, like it just jumped out at me that, well, hang on a minute, I'm, I'm seeing two levels here where you've got some people who are just agents trying to make money. So there's a very core functional job of just trying to make some cash and I'm part time and I've got my kids, you know, maybe four hours a day. Um, but there was another kind of um, uh, group of women who had slightly bigger houses and a little bit of status and something. And the husband was like the village chief. Um, so clearly this was kind of like the first lady of the village, I call it. And, and I found they were spending most of their time not earning money, but training the other agents and earning nothing and I asked one of them you know what's the percentage split here and she said you know 80% helping others succeed and 20% making money and I was like okay so you're not even in this for the money really like like you know so clearly there was a social job there it was about you know status and being seen as this person who um uh, who kind of you know helps helps the community if you like so then we we completely just built a new product not a transactional one but a very social one um, that basically um just just played to that and help is so rather we had a thousand sales agents training people we just removed those and replaced it with a why don't we just have a feed and people can follow the super agents and you can learn from them through a feed and you know um so that's the kind of model we've moved to now and it, it's uh, you know obviously huge savings from an op from the for fixed cost side and um and, and now we can scale much broader across indonesia than, than we could before so so yeah that's a really interesting business and um, i'm still uh, still an advisor there and yeah, really enjoy working with that team
And, and I do remember because I was fortunate enough to come over and meet the, the team. And I don't think I've ever met such an energized, purpose-driven team when we spend yeah. a couple of days there. It's just because it's because I think his full name is Aristan Mapan, which I think translates to something to lifting up and dignity and just, you know, just helping helping the people actually lift, lift themselves up uh, from a social point of view. So yeah, yes. really impressive. And then obviously GoPay being the the payment bid of the super app uh, Gojek, which we'll talk more about. So yeah, if you're if you're happy, would love to love to hear the sort of things you've learned, especially around applying jobs to be done. So um, so I'll hand the screen over to you, and then we'll come back for questions. And actually, anybody as we go through, anybody that's got a question, just type it in the chat on the side, and and we'll allow a little bit of time at the end for Adam to answer them. Thanks, Elsie. Can you see the screen? Okay. Yep, that's coming up nicely. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, I thought I'd share a bit today about how I've um, kind of found this framework, which was pretty nascent. It's still a little bit nascent in terms of its use, um, and it's still developing, but it's, it's really changed the way um, uh, I think about building products. And also, it has this huge advantage of making product the center of gravity in the organization. Um, and everyone kind of, everything, all roads lead to, lead to product as well. And because it, it creates this kind of shared language that everyone can use to talk about customers, it's all about customers. So um, yeah, just to, just, to, just a really high level uh, intro. If you just look at your phone, look at those apps, you know, there's a core job to be done, normally a functional job to be done of each of those apps. And, and if you look at your phone, it's quite fun just to guess what it is. You know, Amazon, I can pretty much buy anything. Um, uh, TikTok, maybe I'm just trying to escape reality. You know, I just want to just get out of like whatever I'm doing or I'm sitting on the toilet even. Um, pay friends back is the, the pay me example we did in um, in Hong Kong, which um, some of you will be familiar with. Um, and yeah, maybe H what's that? HBO Max, yes, go watch well-produced TV series, you know, um, or, or something uh, to, the, to that effect. So I, 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 first of all, I, I'm assuming some of you won't know what jobs to be done is. So I'll give you the kind of classic story that you can search on YouTube and, you know, this is Clayton Christensen, who kind of pioneered some of the thinking, um, uh, but he tells it much better than I will, but I'll, I'll try and use his story to tell it, because I just think it tells it so well, and it uses a well-known brand we all know as well, and some of us love, at least me, guiltily, uh, uh, McDonald's. Um, so this is called the Milkshake Story. Um, so the classic way, uh, so I, I think he was he, him and his team were hired into McDonald's to come and do some consulting. Um, you know, you know business, you're kind of professor of a uh, business at Harvard Business School, you create disruption theory, you know a thing or two, uh, can you help us sell more milkshakes, you know, a real uh, global problem we're dealing with right now, <laughs> we need to sell more milkshakes, and um, and he looked at how they'd gone about it before, um, you know, how did you sell this product before, and, you know, um, it was just like another thing on the menu, and it was, you know, next to the hamburgers, there was a machine, um, and they gave it through the, through the drive throughs and as people ordered in the restaurant, um, and what have you tried so far to improve sales? This is okay. If we basically, you know, we've done our customer journey maps. We've done the personas. You know, these people, you know, read the our, our market. Of these people who seem to read the New York Times, wear black shoes, and drive these cars, and live in these areas, and you know, um, and uh, but they they had they'd seen zero sales growth. And, you know, and, and they were competing with Wendy's and Burger King, if I remember the two kind of, you know, and we, we can't increase our market share. So. They brought uh, jo this jobs to be done view of the, more, uh, um, of the world to, to, to the problem. Um, and so first of all, with jobs to be done, you all, you, the first thing you do is you just go and do the classic kind of observation and watch people. Uh, Anthony, I know you sat in McDonald's when Apple Pay launched. I remember you sitting in McDonald's and just watching how many people use Apple Pay. So Anthony is one of these very curious types you know, <laughs> this kind of, who does follow people. If you see him around in the restaurant, he's probably yeah. watching you. <laughs> yeah, and, I'm, and I'm vegetarian, so uh, so I don't I'm get to partake. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, so so they sat in all these McDonald's, you know. I, I guess they split up and, and they watched people and, and, and when they bought milkshakes. And it, it, for some reason, it was like around six thirty a.m. between six thirty and eight a.m. Um, and then they asked people, you know, why did you buy these milkshakes? Um, you know, what did you hire the milkshake to do? And that's something you hear a lot in this kind of terminology. You know, um, people hire you to do a job in their life. They hire your products just to get some progress. Um, and, it, you know, uh, you know, I'm basically, I, people were commuting to work at that time in the morning and they had like an hour drive on average and, and they needed something uh, along the way. Um, and he said, okay, well, if you didn't buy the milkshake, what else have you tried? Like, you know, let's look at the substitutions here. And they said, well, I tried a Snickers, 
but it was like, you know, you eat one and then you just feel guilty. You can't have that every day, Monday to Friday. Um, I tried a banana, but it was gone too quickly. Uh, I tried a bagel, but, you know, I was putting cheese on and holding the steering wheel and, and getting crumbs everywhere. And it was really messy. So this milkshake kind of like, you know, it lasted all the way to work. I didn't get hungry before lunch because it kind of filled me up. Um, so, so again, so, so the kind of job to be done there, they realized wasn't, you know, just I'm thirsty, like a traditional kind of job to be done, I'm hungry. Um, it was basically, um, you know, I want to, I, I just need to amuse myself on the way to work and just re-engage with life. I need this kind of, just keep me kind of engaged um, because it's, it's, I'm bored. <laughs> so sipping on this milkshake every couple of minutes gave them this kind of like feeling of, oh, I'm back, you know, I'm back in the game or, uh, few, you know. So, um, so they then, once they'd understood this kind of job view of the world, what, what the customers really hired it to do, and they realize they're competing with stickers and bagels and bananas. They basically, the market instantly grows seven times because you're not just competing with other milkshake sellers like Wendy's and Burger King. You're, you're competing with um, all of these um, different substitutes which people hire on their journey to work. And you're actually doing it better than those things. So how can we improve um, um, on, on those metrics? So in the end, the, the, the team, they added, um, they made the, a little bit more of viscous, like, like a bit thicker. So it lasts longer. They, they changed the size of the straw, I believe. I think they made the straw a little bit smaller. So, you know, you can't get as much in per sip. So, you know, it just lasts longer. And, um, and they all put little bits of fruit in as well. So every now and again, you get that variability, uh, which is really important to keep people like engaged, you know, a little bit of variability. If anyone's done gambling before, <laughs> that's hugely important. Um, and then, um, yeah, so the sales lifted, uh, at four, four, I think four X or four times, I assume that means four X, which is pretty uh, incredible, you know, when you, when you can market your product on, on, you know, you can imagine the marketing would be very different as well. So that's, I think that's the best story I've heard about jobs to be done. And when I heard that, I think it really resonated um, with me. Um, and, and I started using it um, pretty much at the time I built Pay Me, actually. So as we were building Pay Me, I, I was reading about this and starting to think about it in, in a few different ways. And um, yeah, I, I'll go to the next and I, slide. I think Adam, and I think you know, the language you used, which I found resonated, was this concept of hiring a product to do something for you and and that purpose yeah. and yeah and it'd be really interesting to know yeah you know how you got to well what what, what the what how come pay me ended up so successful uh, so what what was it that was people were doing but wasn't weren't doing that well uh, that pay me could come and address yeah and, and i think the, the so when you use this framework to build products you should always focus on that kind of functional job they're trying to do first you know so with with pay me it was um it, it was obviously paying friends um you know paying i watched people write checks over the dinner table and anthony was telling me stories of people going to a standard chartered atm taking cash out walking across to put money in another atm because it was free that way and the, the money would blow away or something you know in the wind and there were just so many stories like well okay so clearly you know there's a massive pain point in terms of this functional use case but obviously everyone was attacking it, Octopus, you know, the car, they, they were, they attacked it, they got to market just before us actually. Um, and this product looks similar, but they made some kind of flaws in, in, in their design, which, which I was confident we could still win. And, and, um, and I think Ali and um, Tencent were, had tried as well, and they'd gone after the wrong market, in my opinion, at, at the time. So I knew we had time. I think Jetco as well had done something. Um, um, so, so the way, so you got this functional job, the, the thing I always look out for, and this is what made me successful in my career so far, is just always thinking about the social job. So you've got a functional job, but there will be a bunch of social and emotional jobs as you do it. The emotional job is as I do this, as I perform this job, what do I want to feel? So if you think about um, the job of educating the child, right? Like I want to feel like my child's safe. I want to feel like a good parent. You know, so I'm going to pay extra for some private tuition or whatever. Yeah, so that's, there's an emotional job as well about how I want to feel. But actually, I think more importantly, there's this social job, which if you can understand those, you can get, and again, learning from Indo Cassie and Blackberry, you know, you know, just pure accident of being in, the, in that environment. Um, that can be really powerful. Um, and um, so again, going back to the education example, you know, I want other people to perceive I'm a good parent, which is very important, you know, like, especially in some markets like India example, it's very status driven and, and everyone's watching. And there's lots of events like weddings and things you're always at. So people will, you know, how, how's your kid doing? What you know? So it's all about like, um, um, you know, managing that status as well. So that that and that's a huge driver of, of a lot of behaviour. So with pay me, um, you know, I, I, I yes, I looked at the functional stuff, but I knew if I, you just build another banking app, if you if you if you were functional, because that's how banks products felt at the time. 
so, so I started to look for all the social use cases and, and these are some of them so for instance you know forgetting to pay my friend back you know that you can you know money can ruin friendships if you forget and most people honestly forget it's not like I, I don't want to pay you it's just I've forgotten I'm busy and I'm doing all this other stuff and and the friends it's very awkward to ask for money isn't that, that conversation is always very awkward in, in any market that I've seen um so, so you know so how do we solve for that in our design rather than just that functional sending money from A to B um also the friend saying thank you as well it's nice if someone sends you 100 dollars back if you don't say thank you it's also a little bit rude as well so how can we make that easy um uh, are my friends using this app that security bit, a bit like face the facebook effect i always say like you know if i see all my friends there on a feed it's like i have to be here it's like that kind of fomo effect so so you know that you know for payment we built a feed intentionally because we wanted people to know that other people are using it even if it's just one of my friends and we did one degree connection away as well. So if Anthony pays someone I don't know, I would still see that. So it looks very busy. So, so again, people come and join the party if you like. Um, don't send to the wrong person. Uh, actually, I just finished a stint with, uh, with Gojek in Indonesia and GoPay. And you know, I think we had a thousand people a month that were just paying the wrong person because that account was dormant. And then there'd be call centers. And, and they were the people who did call, by the way. There's probably another 5,000 that didn't bother calling and just never used us again. So it's really important to fix that. You, you, you know, how do we know that person, your friend? So when were they last online? Is there a little green symbol or an orange symbol? These are little cues, which we're all used to now with Slack and things that you can build in just to give that sense of aliveness and that person's really there. And sometimes their previous transactions as well, you know, and you can see the date um, if they shared it. Um, and the last one is, you know, ask for account details. You know, I mean, I, I, so Hong Kong was still, from a UX perspective, I found it a little way behind other markets, even though, it was way ahead in some other respects and, and you know people were still sharing bank codes and things and you know i just said look let's just use whatsapp what's the number one messenger whatsapp and facebook messenger so we had those two on launch we, we removed messenger because no one was using it um and, and you could just you send money to a friend through whatsapp and they get a link and then they click the link and now your friends in pay me so you don't need whatsapp anymore but you use that to establish the friendship because that's where i talk to them and i feel safe and it's encrypted and you know so if you go through that channel it's already there Rather than trying to build a new one using some clunky method like an account or a phone number, that's always uh, that's always the best way. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of that, these are the customer outcomes related to this job that we built for. And you'll notice a lot of them are very very social, and, and that's how we differentiated them. And, and I believe became successful. And I've actually repeated that, copy and pasted it in Indonesia for GoPay, and it's, it's worked exactly the same. It's, it went from number three to number one in in three months just by applying this knowledge. So, um, any questions on this one, Anthony? You wanted to pull out or? No, I think this is great. And I think what I found really interesting when we were chatting about this earlier is, um, and I think it's actually on the next, um, is how that reflected in the app itself. Because a lot of this is subtle. So a lot of the time, like I didn't realize this until you told me. So maybe talk through that. Because I think you know, the, the best design is when you don't even notice it. Mm. Yes, yeah, so, so I think, um... I think we had a good design team on Paymi. Um, we actually used uh, Accenture um, for the first part, and then we actually hired a few designers in. Um, we, had, we built our own team who, who were really like top, you know, high grade designers. Um, some of them worked on like City Mapper and some really cool apps where they're, they're just some of the best UX I've ever used. Have you ever used City Mapper? It's fantastic. It tells you which side of the train to sit on on your commute to work to get there faster based on where you're going. I mean, it's just such such uh, local knowledge. Um, so we had this really good design team. And, and if you, if you, as a product manager, your job is not to try and solutionize for them, it's to give them the problem in a way where they can, here's the boundaries, but you've got this creative space to basically do your thing because that's what, what you're trained in. So that was really important. Um, and designers always love you if you, if you act like that as well. Um, so so this, this method promotes this kind of what's called a job story. So user story is loaded with solution. It's more for like giving to technical teams. Um, but this is more about like you know what's the problem give me the problem and i'll design you a solution so it, it has three parts the first the, the last part is the outcome from the previous slide you know all of these outcomes they can be mapped to one or more job stories so you give it the situation first of all which is missing from user stories right so what, what's the context here what's the context that the customer's in when i need to design for and there could be many of these contexts so you might need to give them a few and the more context the better because then you can be really on point with your design so for instance for this one forget to pay my friend back you know um when i owe a friend some money after a nice dinner so maybe i've just finished and i'm walking off the i'm on the mtr on the way home or maybe um you know we've just played some sport and i need to pay for the field with them or something um, i want to just be able to do it really quickly and not forget right so um so how do we do that so again if you open pay me we built this carousel um which basically can if i remember it, 
this is numbers from uh, from my previous company, but, but I think this is the same for, for pay me because we had faces and names there. Um, and because we could predict who you were going to pay next based on some clever data science, you know, based on the degrees of connection when you paid them last, where you are, et cetera. So there's, there's a few inputs to that. I forget the exact ones. It was 80 percent of people just open the app and click this. Um, so, so that's that's like that's really important. And if you see a face and a name, people I found people always click this. When when we first launched PayMe, like I, we didn't have a you, you couldn't click a face. And when we saw people doing it, it's like, oh my god, it was so stupid. How do we miss that? People want to touch faces and enlarge it and look at it. And you know, maybe they don't tell you, but you know, you, you observe them doing it. So, so this is kind of how we solve the, the the pain points. You know, we handed them over to design in this kind of job story format, loaded with context, and this the output we got. You know, along with some data science input as well, obviously, because they bring a lot of creativity to this. Um, you know, we get these kind of solutions, which turned out to be super convenient. You just open it, press it, boom, it's gone. And even if you open it the next day, it's still that person's going to jump out at you as the person you probably need to pay. So, which I, which I think is. Like I say, I didn't realize that it was just subliminal, but it was there and I could do it. Um, I think one of the things which which I certainly and I think worked really well in Hong Kong was was the people going out and nearly always they'll go out and eat together and somebody will have the say the credit card with the dining offer. And then you walk, you know, I think I'm right in saying you walk straight into that problem of You've got a group of people who now need to split the bill because the person with the dining offer um so was that did that end up was that one of the main use cases did that did that because the growth was really quick at the beginning yeah for sure for sure um yeah we, we used to go to um so andrew alden there was the um the kind of the business sponsor if you like on this uh, you, i know you know um and he, he created this whatsapp uh, group called pay me in the wild and we would just go to restaurants and we'd see you know, someone would be using pay me and then obviously curious people would go over and ask and then all of them would open their phone and show the pay me app like there'd be like eight people around the table <laughs> holding pay me open and it become this kind of fun thing that you just got out at the end of a meal and it was i mean it's so cool to see if you built something and see you know people actually enjoying the product it's, it's really cool um so and i we even found um people told us we never used the feed um and we hate the feed why is the feed there and i was like i don't think it needs to be there forever it's just at the beginning to get the ball rolling and um but you know, I, I was in a whiskey part once with Andrew sat here, and I'm here, and he was like, "Someone's using pay me literally on the store next to me." I looked over, <laughs> and he's scrolling the feed, looking at the feed, and you know. So even though people tell you they don't use it, we call people using it a lot, um, and you can see, you know, they open the app on the homepage and then they close it. You know, what else are they doing? So, so again, it's it's quite curious what people tell you in the interviews and things. It's also very different to, to the data you see. So you have to you have to map those two things together to really understand what's going on. Yeah, and I think that really live you know that observation and you know what i would call the ethnographic side of yeah like me sitting in the back of mcdonald's watching the percentage of people paying with different paper products <laughs> to find out what's really going on um so that, i think that's that's fascinating so you you obviously then made a move to yeah to mapan and then through that actually to gojek now Gojek is one of my favorite examples of, of doing one thing really, really well and then expanding. So I am not don't know if everybody knows uh, the one thing that Gojek did well, um, although we were chatting a little bit about it. And then how did it expand out and how long before they got GoPay in there, which you ended up being the, the VP of product for? So I think... Um... So Gojek started off with a kind of, a, it was, it, again, it's that going back to that core job to be done. So if you look at, again, I study this so deeply that it's almost embarrassing where if you want to understand social behavior, you have to go look at primates. And there's, there's like Robin Dunbar, who's the Dunbar number, the 150 number I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. He wrote this brilliant book called Human Evolution, um, which talks about how we evolve through a social context. So he looks at primates and how they hang out in groups and what's the group size in relation to brain size. And the way he understood the evolution was looking at time budget models, where you, you basically follow a troop of chimps around for months and document how much percentage of their time in the day do they spend doing what jobs. Um, he didn't call them jobs, but it's essentially what he meant. So, you know, 12 hours of sleep. And then when 12 hours awake, when, when, when the sun is in the tropics, you basically, you know, they spend around 40% of their time grooming each other, which means making friends and building coalitions, 40% of their day, which is crazy. They spend around another 35 40 percent of their day eating which means 
you know, literally picking things off a tree and putting them in the mouth and chewing, like, so it's an incredible amount of time. And then traveling to find food was, was the third one, I think. And then the last one is resting because in the midday sun, four hours, you can't move around, it's too hot. And then also digesting. So there's only like four jobs, that, you know, 80% of the time, they're only doing four things. Um, and I'm always really fascinated to basically map that back to us. And, and you know, and, and, and when I got into Gojek, I just read this book and I thought about what Gojek was. So go, what Gojek does, Fundamentally, it, 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 um, there's, it, the traffic's really bad in Southeast Asia. So Uber, the model with Uber with cars, it wasn't really the, their first use case. It was actually motorbike taxis. There were these motorbike taxis who, who you could find on the side of the street in the rain and get them to come to you and, and they could take you through all the traffic and you could get there in about, sometimes about a third of the time. So, and, and, you know, to get to meetings, that was a, a mandatory to do that. Um, and these drivers just were underutilized because you couldn't get them and they didn't have smartphones. So the minute they got Android, it was cheap enough to give to these drivers. They obviously built the kind of Uber model um, and that became that core job to be done, like literally get me from A to B, um, which people in, in Jakarta, you could, in Jakarta, in Indonesia, you'd spend around four or five hours a day on the road easily in traffic, you know, just sitting there. So, so this was a huge unlocking, giving people their time back, right? Instead of holding the steering wheel, or holding, you know, I can actually work in the back of the car. So, so again, it's about that time budget, how much time do you have in the day, how much time can we give you back? And there's a core job to be done. So they solved that. And then what was the next one? Well, Again, going back to the chimps, like the second one was food, right? Well, Gojek um, went into Go Food, so they went. That was Go Ride, then they did Go Food. Again, it just exploded because they, you had all these competing companies like Food Panda, and they weren't on demand, so they owned the driver fleet, so they couldn't scale to demand, right? At, at will, um, so they just trounced everybody overnight, basically. And, and, and um, you know, these drivers, instead of picking people up, they just went to a restaurant and picked your food up, and then that brings along a huge load of merchants, and then obviously. There's payment issues because you know you don't have enough cash or whatever. So we started, you know, we built a wallet in there as well, and that became what is called GoPay now. And, and then GoPay branched off into its own product group, which I worked for. And you know, we had um, lots of different use cases, which I'll, I'll explain on, on the next slide. But um, Anthony, if I may, I just want to make a quick point here on, on this slide before we move on to that. Um, so this is um, just 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 saying that like if you focus on the social jobs. Um, you invariably are looking for network effects, right? Because social is a very network thing. Um, so again, PayMe, BlackBerry Messenger, obviously, um, GoPay, Mapan, um, even the, the charity company I built as well. These are all social companies. And if you learn how to do these kind of graphs, these kind of network graphs, um, you, you can really see like the evolution over time as you build these network effects. So, so what this is, this is a small part of the GoPay network in Indonesia. So Q2 and Q3 is last year before we built the social features. They already had this kind of payment system, but, but it, was, it was like number three. And the minute we built social and we did a few campaigns and things and to get that virality, uh, uh, the network effect going, you know, you just see this massive explosion in use. And, and it, it's just every month, um, you know, I get the reports on how it's doing. It's the same as payment. It just keeps keeps getting denser and denser and denser. And, it, and it's to the point where someone on another, another app is like, hey, can you pay me on this app it's like no no we're all over here like this network's too dense but most people don't see that network so that's why I, I have to spend a lot of time educating people on these kind of networks as to why they're so valuable for business it's a moat right you're building a strategic moat basically so that's just a quick point I wanted to make um, no that's very visual and you're right uh, it really lights up doesn't it so so yeah. when you arrived at GoPay what did they ask you to do I guess this is where you're heading now what you know what was your challenge when you when you got there so in, in GoPay, uh, the big challenge, I was working in Marpan. Uh, I, I was really enjoying it, actually, but um, th there was COVID happened and, and we massively needed to downsize because unfortunately our market, you know, it was based on their small amount of disposable income to go into these savings clubs. But what did COVID do? It squeezed that income, right? So, so in good conscience, we turned off the product. We just said we can't even push this because it's not fair because they wouldn't be able to pay back over the 10 months. So we shouldn't be forcing them into these contracts, um, which is interesting. We got, we've got a bunch of new competitors who basically went into the market then just just to go and do what we did um but they haven't actually survived most of them i think when we're, we're back on now so we had to retrench a bunch of people it was horrific as a manager so you know we had to let go of like 40 percent of our team which was very sad um but, but i exited as well I, because i was quite expensive a foreign resource and so i exited um and became an advisor and i was asked to come over to gopay and said hey gopay have this problem um we've been expanding offline using qr code payment for the last year and we're spending, you know, billions of dollars and we're competing with Grab and, and other wallets in the market. Um, and it's basically, you know, consumers are having a great time because there's 50% cash back on everything you buy. Just whatever wallet you want to use, 
use that QR code and we'll fund you back in real time to cash 50% back. And obviously everyone downloads the wallet, everyone uses it. But there was nothing sustainable there. There was no loyalty. People were just switching between, just kind of like the drivers do on, on, on the other side to, with the different apps. Um, in other words, there was no network effect like this. If you think about the, the graph for that, you go and pay a merchant, it lights up between you and the merchant and then it goes off and then that's lost now. You don't, make, you don't keep that connection. So there was no kind of, there was nothing in the product that built this network effect. Um, so again, it was that, you know, what can we do in terms of, we can't keep giving money away like this. It's not sustainable. Um, and none of us can, the whole market needs to stop um, because the investors are saying, we can't keep doing that. I mean, you're, you're big now, but how do we get sustainable growth? Um, so it was about how do we make you social? So, so again, pay me works. So let's, let's apply that playbook. Um, first of all, just improve your existing product because it's not, it's not good enough right now. It's using phone numbers for a start. And then number two, um, let's look at other use cases. So they hired um, IDEO to come and do the on the ground research in Indonesia. And they found um, this amazing uh, insight where they went into people's houses and they saw people getting money in and just splitting it the day they got it in, just to organize it in their mind into like bills, into savings, into school kids. And, and once they were in those pockets or pop envelopes or whatever, it was just kind of it's called mental accounting, like a behavioral economics heuristic. Uh, where once it has a label on it, like we behave very differently with that money, but you've got to get that damn label on as soon as you can, otherwise you'll spend that money. Um, it's a bit like why did casino give you chips, right? Well, as soon as it's a chip, that's a label, spend me. <laughs> you never, never take me back and exchange me for cash, right? So, 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 um, so we saw, uh, IDEO saw this behavior and we saw a bunch of other jobs that were going on, um, you know, giving savings to your mum to get it out of the house, um, trying to allocate money to the kids and, and, and monitor that. So what we did is we, we, because we had this social payment network, we then said, how, what if we built a social banking network using that same network? So we have, we have a social network. It just happens to be for point-to-point -point payments. So how do we move into that? Are these other jobs to be done for um, you know, managing and partitioning my money and, and, and being able to collaborate on money with my loved ones, even my kids? So what we did is we, uh, they, they invested in a, in a neo bank um, called Bank Jago, who had this beautiful API they built for creating an account, creating N accounts, you could have N cards and you could share those accounts, et cetera. And we put that into the Gojek super app with like hundred million users. And, and, and we, you know, we enable people to one, open the, the account through that with a video KYC and two, be able to create N number of pockets, give them a label and a, and a photo, and then even share those pockets with other um, people in the network as well. So I could create a pocket called, um, you know, transport for the family. And my kids, I could then give them budget for go ride, so they could get to school every day on go ride. But they could see that money going down as a family, so they start to learn financial services by actually doing it instead of this abstract concept of money, which I, I, I struggle to understand even in my twenties. Um, so, so, that, so that's what you know. There's a couple of use cases that, that we built, but all of them are based around this building this loyalty and network effect as you build the use cases. And and, and yeah, and, and this is the result. If you look at this, this is just the payment, but the banking one is. Still early days, but, but yeah, I assume it's uh, the same. I think um, if I go to the next slide, though, um, I think this is where this homepage on the right hand side here. So we kind of like done the pay me features and, and we had this kind of menu within this super app. And it's very like, you know, it's not a nice UX, right? Because it's just buttons, it's like very functional. And we had everyone saying, you know, we need this new homepage. How can we think about this? Um, and again, so I, I said, stop, let's use jobs to be done. What are the jobs our customers want to do? What are the outcomes they're trying to get at what time? And how can we all think about you know, the world in that way? So we created all these jobs. We looked at all the jobs we've done, a, fin a fintech of our size, which kind of covered everything. Um, what are those abstract jobs uh, that we do? And, and these were the jobs we came up with. So manage and partition my money was the one I just mentioned. Paying for my daily spend, just you know, a wallet paying around for McDonald's and whatever. This is the pay me use case, regular bills. Um, that's repeated, sorry. Um, buy something I don't have money for today. That's more like borrowing, like short-term borrowing. Pay for goods and services. Um, that's more like more like an online version, if I remember. Um, protect my family from bad happens like insurance. Grow my savings. So you know, allocate money for the future, put it away somewhere, give it a label, but also can I invest that and make it grow faster than, than um, inflation or whatever? So, um, so, so this is how we thought about it. And then we started to organize the product teams around these jobs. So the product manager got a job, hey, that's your job. And think about it end to end, not just the screen, but the whole service around it. Like if someone calls or texts is in, and how do we respond to that in the context of your job and make it a really great experience? Um, I always look at Tesla as a great model for like that kind of, it's a product, yes, but it's just this constantly evolving service. Um, 
and and so then, and then we completely redesigned the homepage. It's not out yet. It's, it's we're actually building a new app. Uh, we decided to build a new app um, and, and step outside the super app. Um, and this is going to be um, you'll see all these like little jobs and, and how they're kind of you know based on who you are. You know, maybe I'm only doing these three jobs, so I don't need to see all the other jobs yet. So so contextualize the UI around the jobs I care about and those outcomes I need at that particular point in time. And there's a lot of like intelligence from the data team we need from that about that context um, and a lot of dynamic UIs and a lot of cool technology we got to use. So, so yeah, that, that was really, uh, really exciting. I haven't actually seen the end end product yet in, in, in the app. I saw the latest design before I left. Um, so yeah, that's, that's super exciting as well. No, fascinating. And um, actually there's, there's some questions um, really around um, how do you go about, and you referred to it a little bit there because you referred to different sources of information, but really researching that social job because you can't just you can't just go and interview for that. You, it, so I think maybe expand around obviously that combination of what what I would call the ethnographic observational like IDEO did, where they're actually sitting there and seeing what happens. Plus, you also mentioned the the use of data. So how do you begin to pull these out? What's the you know, what's the practical mechanism? Um, there's yeah. a couple of questions around that of how to find these emotional and then social jobs as well the functional ones are probably easier to see it's the other two that are harder yes yeah, so i actually wrote quite a long blog on this it's like it's, it's a dump of all my kind of reading and synthesized for this exact question um and giving examples of pay me and in, in the cassie and um i think it's my the third one um uh, happy to share it after the call as, as a url um but um but yeah it talks about the first thing you have to do is just understand at a deeper level what's going on like almost like animal instinct of connecting um it's really important to understand that first and i find if you try and attack it without that you you might get some little successes but you won't it won't be a very integrated approach and, and you might not get the network effect you're looking for i think octopus is a great example there their app which is exactly the same as pay me they just miss some core cool things like they put friction in places which you should not put friction um, um between people you know and, and that stops the the growth of the network so so i think yeah number one just just read some of the books but like if you want a shortcut you can read the blog i wrote on, the, on this exact topic um i think uh just to give you some like some snippets um so understand that you know we manage our relationships that 150 number of people we we we, we can manage at any one time um if you add another one someone has to leave um so understanding how uh the time spent with each uh, with um, so the categorization of those people, so it's actually concentric circles. So in the middle, you have this five core people, that's a clique. All of those people know each other. So that's a really good thing. If you're building a product, if you've got five people and everybody knows each other, then could you, is there other use cases around that you could build? So for instance, in Gojek, we looked at that, that triggered things like shared subscription, fam, family subscriptions, or um, sharing your, if, if, if I give credit to mum, can dad and the kids also use that credit? because it's, it's their credit, they're just sharing it, right? So, so there's certain use cases, once you understand that there are people have these concentric circles of five people, family, normally it's around half family, half friends. Um, um, so, 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 and then the next, and you spend around 40% of your social energy just on those five people. Um, and the way to test who they are, just if you have a, a chest pain in the night, who would you call? That's kind of a good test to see uh, who's on that list. And then the fifth, there's another 10 on the next layer out, like further away from you. Um, that's called your kind of um, your sympathy group. Um, you go to their funeral if, if, if they passed away, right? Like that's how kind of close you are. Um, you spend another 20% of your time with those people. And everyone's the same, by the way. There's obviously variance, but generally everyone's around, you know, these are two key circles which you can build your product around. And that second circle, like for instance, that's more like your friendship group. So again, pay me in the feed. That's the kind of like that feed. And if you look at that, that's that group and maybe a little bit wider. Um, and there's lots of things you can build for that group as well. But I think, and, and as it goes out, you get further away and some of it's just kind of social capital, they call it, keeping them around just in case. So I think just knowing that and, and building your product with that kind of knowledge is really key. Otherwise, you, you probably, you'll miss the mark, right? You, you, won't hit, you won't hit it where you need to hit it because you don't understand the fundamental kind of social structures with how we organize society. And I think a great um, example of technology understands that now so why is the agile team four or five people exactly because that's the size of that group right four people can share the architecture the whole system in their head between them through conversation and they don't need to write everything down but if you add 
six or seven people to a group, you've lost it. Like you have to split into two teams and build microservices. So I think tech now understands that you engineer teams around this constraint. Um, it's called reverse Conway's law. You basically like map the system to this constraint. Um, but the product bit on the top, you still need to understand. And this is, this is, you know, uh, yep. part of the question, I guess. Um, no, and I think that's really interesting. You're right. The bit you've just referred to, and I think I saw Kirk um, on the call earlier, who was one of the people that introduced uh, me to team topologies, uh, which is is this holding the bit of the system you're looking after as a full team in your head. It's your cognitive yeah. ability. Um, I think the other thing which is interesting, what you referred to in terms of that small group and then sharing things, um, Apple, uh, with Goldman Sachs behind it, just launched that ability to build credit histories for the younger members of the family using the, the parents' capability. Uh, wow. And obviously that's in the US where credit, credit histories are really important. So hmm. I think um, the other thing you referred to a little bit, and maybe this leads on to it, um, the next point is that you, know, you chatted about before we started. Um, so when you try and survey customers and and try and use data to do this, can you find these? Can you find interesting groups through through doing that? Uh, what happens when you actually try and put some data behind this? Say you've got an environment where people want some. Okay, Adam, this sounds great, but can you show me some quantitative as well as qualitative uh, information? Yes. Yeah, so, so this is um. Again, I, I've blogged about this as well. So, so um, I tried to synthesize all of this into blogs and said, look, this is how you do it, like step by step, because more for like scaling my own teams, because if you have to repeat everything many times, it, it, you know, it's a waste of your time. So write it down, share the blog, but also share it externally as well. So you're welcome to, to read those. Um, it's on Medium. But basically, um, you know, interview your customers, understand what the job to be done is, understand the outcomes they're trying to do. Um, you know, I, I, I'm doing it in Prodigy now. I'm spending every day. I'm interviewing three customers in different stages of the funnel and just just talking to them and trying to shake out all of those outcomes. What are those outcomes they're trying to get at the beginning, in the middle, at the end, um, and just putting them all in a big list. Um, and if you think you've got them all, don't stop. Keep going. There's always one or two more um, um, you can shake out from more interviews or meeting the same customer again uh, with, with the previous contact. So that's like a quite a big piece of work, but it's the most important, obviously. So you get all these outcomes and you'll hear about all these social and emotional jobs as part of that. Um, so for instance, I was just doing a call today for Prodigy and there was a, a girl in India who's going to, to Yale, I think, uh, next year. And she, she's getting a loan from us. And, and, you know, I asked the questions around her family. What do your parents think about this? Are they happy for you? You know, uh, do you have any siblings? Have they gone to the US and studied before? Um, you know, it turns out her brother's there. Oh, are you going to the same university? Is that a coincidence? No, I, I want someone put, you know, so you start to hear about these, these connections between people through those interviews as well. And that's where you get a lot of the, the ideas from, if you like. Um, and then um, once you've got that data, um, you, you end up with a list of these outcomes and there's a certain way to write them. So everybody understands it objectively. You never use the word easier because that means different things to different people, et cetera. So, so you have this list and then what you do, you move into um, the quantitative phase and, and, and you basically try and quant that across obviously more people because it may have just been the 10 people you talk to, you know, or similar, which, which wouldn't be good if you tried to scale it. And to quant it, you, you basically just ask those questions plus a few profile questions and you just, you know, how important is this to you on a like at scale minus three to plus three, um, this particular outcome. So for pay me, you know, how important was it to not forget to pay your friend back? It's super important, plus three. As far as I can go, <laughs> you know, um, because otherwise it ruins a friendship and, and, and that ripples out throughout my network as well. I'm known as a person who doesn't pay people back and that's not a good thing to me. And then, uh, then you ask them, OK, but how satisfied are you today with the last time you did that? And, and then, you know, sometimes you ask them which product you used as well. So it gives you an indicator as, as to the strength of the, the products out there. That's your kind of competitive research. And they'll, they'll say, you know, but, you know, satisfied, maybe minus two, because I keep forgetting. Um, so then, what, then you get this result of this survey, and then what happens is, actually, I have a slide for this. Um, yeah, this happens, right? So you get this kind of all the, all the questions you asked. You can map them across these two axes, like satisfaction and importance. Um, so this one, this was out of five, but you, you use, always use the like it, because <laughs> otherwise four means something different to two different people. And every time I did this at the beginning, I did this in PayMe for once we'd, once we'd nailed payments, I, we're looking at what to do next. I did this and we ended up with this clump. It's like, okay, well, everyone looks the same. Like these are all the questions, question 21, 18, and everyone on average are kind of, you know, it's, yes, it's important, but I'm satisfied. So there's nothing for us to do. If it was down here, it's super important, but 
not satisfied, okay, underserved, let's build some solutions for that. Overserved, okay, let's just take some features away and make it cheaper, you know. Um, but, you know, what do we do with this? And, and when I moved to map and I tried this again and got the same result, I was like, what's going on here? And then I learned how to cluster, cluster responses, so cluster the needs. Um, and it was actually Genie in Hong Kong, a company I've been advising now. Um, they were looking at pivoting into merchants from consumers. They're doing like a cash, they, they, they know there's a problem in forecasting, especially with COVID, you know, forecasting. If I took that, those staff members away or kept them on, what's the impact on my cash flow in six months? You know, that kind of, these are big questions for, for startups and, and any company, SME. So, um, so we did this and then Victor, the co-founder there, pinged me on WhatsApp and said, Adam, it's, everyone looks the same. And I was like, oh my God, it's happened again. I've, I've just worked out this method called clustering. Let's try this. And we did it. And what you do is you run it through like a, an algorithm like K-means or something like any, any kind of a clustering algorithm. And, and, and you, um, you cluster it on, the, on, on kind of a combination of these two scores and you end up like separating uh, the groups and, and this is an example from another project that I got two clusters. In, in their case, we found three clusters and they were very, very distinct. And then what you do is you analyze what those needs are. So, you know, these are all kind of underserved here. What are all these needs which, which are related to this cluster? And then you start to give that a persona name and, and color it in. And you start to look at the demographics of these people. Again, their correlations don't be driven by those, you know, but this is variance. Um, and also other profile questions you ask them. So for instance, how big is your business? Um, what's your job title? you know, um, uh, what tools do you use? So in the Genie case, we, we found this group of like really people who really understood for like data and analysis and mostly from the US, mostly male, these were the correlation things, but all the needs were, um, were very different to another group, which were, you know, very kind of, um, I need to make decisions, but I don't have the skills. And then I use some pretty, I use Excel for everything. <laughs> we, I think we called them the Excelers was, was that cluster name. And then there was another group which kind of didn't really have it. They, they were fine. Um, I, I forget that segment. It wasn't that important. So what happens is the product teams can suddenly jump on one of those clusters and, and make a decision, which one do we go after? Don't go after an average because there's no such thing as an average customer. But once you kind of separate them into these clusters based on needs, not, not demographics and psychographics, just on the actual needs from the survey, which you heard in the interviews, you, I'm pretty confident like you'll hit the mark first time as long as you design a nice solution. Um, this tells you what you need to do uh, and, and what first, and that just goes straight into your product roadmaps. Like it's that kind of any 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 customer thing on your product roadmap will probably be one of these dots you've solved. Um, yeah, oh, that's that's great. So um, so actually the actually coming to the jobs to be done. Um, so there's a there's a question. Of, you know, have you been more influenced by the Clay, Clay, the Clay Christensen side, or did you also spend time looking at the Tony Ulwick? Uh, as a bit of a, you know, you know, have both of them influenced you, or yeah? So where who influenced that bit of the sort of jobs to be done learning? Yeah, I mean, you take bits from both. I mean, yeah, it, it's it's like anything, right? Any standard. You know, there's, there's a war until it becomes a standard. I feel like this is this will always be kind of, you know, kind of split out across several different. If you look, someone who comes from marketing tend to be more on the on the um, um, the Chris Christensen, um, yeah. you know, coffee meets kale is another book I think like that. You know, they're more on the market side and the, the you know the the entire customer experience. I think that's really valuable, right? Because you can actually that's how you integrate your marketing messages, right? You yeah. can actually integrate and have conversations around that. Whereas Tony Ulwick, who's much more functional, much more kind of task oriented, um, he comes from an IBM process background, if you look at his background, he's brilliant because he brings a precision to innovation. He makes it like a science that you can you know, have these kind of charts and look at them. So I take both of them, I have both of them put them together. Um, there's a good book that um, the Genie founders gave me, which I hadn't heard of called uh, Jobs to be Done. Um, road, um, Playbook, is it the Playbook one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had a quick flick through that, like just before a meeting with them. And it basically summarizes all of it and said, look, these are all the good, the bad, and the ugly. This is kind of somewhere in the middle. And, and honestly, that's the best approach. I think, um, you know, I wouldn't say one's right, one's wrong. Yeah. No, it's like most of these things that actually you just want to take the best bits. They like the uh, ongoing different approaches to scaling agile. Uh, you just want to take the best bits and then, yeah, then exactly. see what works. Um, so, Maybe actually, there's another question. Anything about the major pitfalls of jobs to be done? Is the have you seen it where it hasn't worked and things to avoid getting tripped up on? Anything there from your point of view? Yeah, I, I definitely think um, 
so when I implemented this in Gojek, um, I think we had around, I want to say around 150 PMs in Gojek, plus around 100 researchers, 100 designers, right? So it's a big, you know, so, and, and I tried it in one area and scaled it to, to a bigger, and then, I, and then people started asking, hey, how, how do we do this? And I did a presentation to all the researchers and taught them, this is how we do it. And then I, same for the PMs. And I started to see it used all over the organization. You know, so I could see my template. If I go to Google Drive, you can see it all over the different products. Like, oh, this is great. You know, people are actually like do, using this. This is really good for us because we can all speak the same language um, across all the different functions. Um, the, the people who struggled with, with things like platform teams um, where they were dealing with internal customers, it doesn't work that well, to be honest. You need like lots of consumers um, um, in order to really get all of these. Because it's quite, it's, it's, one, there's a big learning curve. And two, it's quite a heavy process, right? I mean, it's very much on the discovery side. Um, you know, and if you're, you know, if you're responding to um, internal needs, it can be quite fiery. Like there's always a fire going on and this, this takes priority. So sometimes you just don't have a choice. Sometimes you don't have time to step back and do these big analysis. And there's just not that many people to talk to either because there's only like 10 people managing this portal or this system. And so, so I think I've seen people struggle with it on these kind of platform teams. You support, tend to support either other systems or internal capabilities. Um, B2B, another one, like some, it hasn't been as easy with B2B, but I feel like, with Genie, that's kind of, we kind of moved past that and got through it. It has been very useful, I think. Um, the same, there's a company in Indonesia who just do payments for schools. We've used it there as well, and, and it's become really useful. Um, and I think the it's one more thing I wanted to mention. Um, yeah, I think it needs a lot of guidance as well. You can't just give it to somebody in an organization and they run with it. You need to, it, you've got to be coached because um, especially through the bit where you extract these outcomes from the interviews and put them into a survey. I, I, every time I've done that with someone and they've gone off on their own, they've come back and it's complete. You're gonna waste six weeks of effort here if you do it like this, uh, let me just hold your hand. And it's quite time intensive to coach. So I would definitely say that uh, if you're gonna use this, make sure you get a good coach um, because uh, it's very easy just to, just to waste a lot of time and, and then you'll give up on it, which is bad because it took me four or five goes before it actually became really it's you know, super useful and it directs all of the stuff I do now. And that's always, you know, from sh actually shape, there's a real, actually both science and there is actually a science, but there's equally, there's an art in the wording, being very, very careful with the wording, because otherwise you, you're asking, you end up asking leading questions um, and, and well-structured surveys, especially for this, I can imagine are really important. There, were, there was a quick question, because I think you mentioned minus three to plus three, which for me would be the, whatever scale you want to use. There was a question about any reason for that, or obviously you used five here or yeah. 10. You know, what, is, it the, is it actually neutral, you know, a degree of, positive and a, and a very positive is it is that what is actually what you're doing and you don't really care what the scale is or, or is there a, is there something good about the plus and the minus that you found yeah that's, that's um, and again this is through experience of doing a lot of these surveys and not getting optimal results even the one i did with genie i'm quite sad that we didn't do it we, we were one away from perfect we polished it and then, but there was one missing thing we didn't do which was annoying um but the last one the last two i've done are just are just like okay we, this works now this is so the tony Olwick method says do it with 10 you know, out of 10, how important, how satisfied, tried that twice, you know, a seven to one group of people means, you know, a five to other group of people. Yeah. And just, there's just too much width and there's no but, middle as well. They're very kind of neutral. The example I always use if, if people from the UK is, you know, is a Yorkshireman. So the best you'll ever get is probably a six. <laughs> Um, whereas, you know, somebody more like an Italian, you know, somebody that's really positive, they'll, a six will be a 10, but you, you've, it's a really big problem, that social referencing. Yeah, and in Indonesia, people are very positive. Well. Like, <laughs> it's like everything's kind of a, a, a 10 or a nine. And yep. so, yeah, so, so basically, I, and, and again, having, having, having to take this data and process it myself and clean it, you know, you really do see like, okay, this isn't working like the range the range is too small or the you know the um the, all these people only around to between these two numbers these people these sets of people between these two numbers you know so do you normalize them um, and to take all that away um i tried to like it someone mentioned the like it, which said that'd probably be better because at least you got a middle and a left and a right um so, so that was great and i tried a plus seven minus seven or something a bit bigger um and i got that same problem again where what is a plus two versus a plus three there's a group of people who just say two and three 
and there's a group of people who play say five and six are they saying the same thing or, or is that really that gap true and that was something like i didn't trust um and, and again these were guided interview guided surveys as well so in the end i was like well how can i just shrink it to say look like you said it's like possible positive or really positive or negative or really negative make it as simple as you can yeah. so at least i can trust the results coming in and, and yes you don't get as much variance as, as i'd like but at least it's it's kind of binary shifts on each question yeah. that you can kind of get a sense of uh, and, and yeah and, and so far it's been it's, it's that's really worked that approach no that's a good insight um um kirk who, who who i know you know um was actually asking of do you see this how do you see this work he was actually saying do you see it competing with design thinking approach or how do you see it complementing where where does it sit with the sort of design because obviously ideo is your you know who came up with design thinking so how how do they move make these work together because i assume they don't see them as competing no, no not at all yeah so they're super complementary so i think what um i think my problem with like research and design in most organizations i've worked in is that the output is just so vague and like these five bullet points of these insights and it's like, well, that's really interesting, but how do we take those and take them along the product journey and for like six months while we figure out what to build, you know, there's a whole lot of process. And then you don't talk to those researchers for a while or their consultants and they're not there anymore. What does that insight really mean um, um, over this period of time until you launch? And then you need to go and check if you've actually solved the problem. You know, And the biggest complaint I get from research teams and, and, and research were my best friend in Gojek and in Mapan because this was a problem for them as well. Um, is that, you know, I found it, I found an insight and I don't see it in the product. Like why are my insights not getting into the product? And it's, it's a language problem, right? You're handing over this quite wide statement about an insight. So for instance, and, and in idea, obviously they use design thinking, right? So in Indonesia, the, the output of their work, it was the same. It, it was, it was a bit more precise, but it was still quite like, here's some insights. Um, so what, what jobs to be done is it puts a layer on top of that, that makes it so much more objective and concrete about what those insights mean. Um, so, so we converted IDEO's output into this, out, this outcome statement format and did the survey. Um, so, so, so that was an exercise. But what we did in Gojek, you also used design thinking, is we said, look, integrate jobs to be done into your process and make the outputs of your research, these outcome statements, which are super objective, and, and I understand exactly the same thing as you. And if a customer sees it, they'll understand the same thing. Very important to surveys. And then what happens is the research team become really happy because they see that insight travel across time. Um, all the way into the product and then they're waiting there like the minute it launches and they're rushing out and um, it's kind of, I said it's like an, an analogy but like the team in, in GoPay for instance they were just like rushing to go meet the customer who tried it and said hey hey did this work <laughs> solve that problem and, and you know so you see that that's what I mean by it integrates all these different functions together and, and so yeah it works with design thinking but it adds a layer of objectivity on top of it it plugs it into the rest of the process I think. And, and did you find it you had actually worked articulating it to you know, to the real, frankly, the, the real, one of the groups of magic workers, we've got a number of magic workers here, but, but since we're in software, this needs to translate into the, the problem the team solving with the, the engineers at the heart of it. Did you find you could actually get it in a language that they appreciated as well? You mean the, the engineers? Yes, the engineers, because you, you actually, in my experience, they really need to know what problem you're solving and they'll come and find out the more context they get, the better you'll end up solving the actual problem. Um, yeah, yeah, and, and, and I think that's, yeah, there's, um, yeah, because once it's coded, right, like that's, that's that is that's the implementation. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so yeah, so the feedback I got as I left the uh, Gojek a few months ago was from the engineers, because I got, I wanted feedback on everybody on how did, how was this, so I could take that into my next job. Um, and, and from the engineers, it was very positive, like, because, um, um, so, the, you know, the, the, the really good engineers, which Gojek, like the bar was so high to get in, like, you know, it's like 50 interviews. Um, so 50 people, um, one in 50 would get in or something who applied for and got to the first round even. Um, so the engineering, the bar was really high. I'd never worked with engineers like on, on that level. You could just, just, you know, do features this fast for, for us. Um, and the thing they care about is like they want to build, so it might be you know, two things. One, they want to build really interesting, complex, you know, forefront systems, which no one's done before. And, you know, so that's kind of one thing which I found, you know, good engineers really like. But the other thing is they do want to make the impact, right? Because they, they do choose their organizations based on what, what's the mission and what are you trying to do. And if they're working on something which is, which they feel is suboptimal or it doesn't crack the problem. And a lot of them in Gojek are actually based in India. Um, and and they, there's a lot happening in India now, which 
it, it, you know, it's similar to Indonesia. So they have a lot of input on, you know, actually we sold it this way. Are you sure we can't do that? So this, again, this process kind of, it, 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 it helps defend some of the arguments where, okay, that works in India, but it probably won't work here. So it stops that, but it also um, it integrates them in that they know as they're building something, I can follow that all the way back to the research document and all the way through the design process and all the way to the product roadmap and all the way down to the code. You know, so they can, they can see that line as well. So they're quite confident now that, okay, we're building something that actually has value. And, and, and so, yeah, so that's kind of the feedback I got as I, as I left. Um, and also uh, they were saying that the, the, before that, the PMs were just kind of doing stuff, you know, they, they, they were busy um, building things we thought were valuable, but, you know, when we launched them, they didn't have anywhere near as a success than, than they, they initially hoped. And that was a bit disheartening, right, for someone who spends all the time coding something. Yeah, no, definitely. So, I mean, you've ended up working for um, in HSBC and Gojek, two organizations that have this phenomenal reach into the market. I mean, HSBC has, with Hang Seng has about 70% reach into the market, you know, incredibly successful, um, traditional, and obviously you were involved in, in, in helping them challenge and, and, and become uh, more dynamic from a digital point of view. Then you ended up going to Gojek, which is really a, a modern uh, big tech company. Um, in my experience, organizations always have a limiting factor. There's always something stopping things move, you know, the organization growing and doing more. I think what you've shared, and thank you very much, you know, it's always fascinating to hear of the ex your experiences. You know, you've found a way to deal with what usually is the hardest thing is that product market fit because that usually trips most people up like you say you build something probably well-intentioned and actually nobody's bothered so so you've got over that but thinking back now really big picture um you know what do you think was the limiting factor for hsbc not going quicker and maybe particularly pay me and then perhaps as you went into Gojek, what was its limiting factor? Because I'm sure you had a different one. Um... Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, so I think if I remember the, my reasons for leaving HSBC were, one is that we were struggling to hire the right talent for the job we had, right? And we were using a lot of consultants um, and that's not a good model for, you know, um, for owning that, for being an empowered team, right? If you work for another brand and you know, you're kind of loaned in. Um, and I wanted to, and I didn't know how to solve that problem uh, and go faster. Like we were, we were trying to, you know, we had this big roadmap of ideas and, um, and, you know, it just seemed like six months later, we hadn't moved anywhere and we were just fighting fires and, and it, that was super frustrating. It's like, you know, we're not moving and, and, you know, I feel like I'm getting older and watching, you know, so it was quite frustrating and, and um, you know, kudos to the team for getting as far as they did, but, you know, it was, it was, it was tough. Um, and that was really, I guess that's really what you were talking about. The energy comes, as you talked about it, when you get in market and you see it happening. So yeah. waiting six months becomes, that's a long, that can be a long time. So, yeah, so yeah. what about, <laughs> so what about Gojek? I mean, all my instinct says they must be able to go faster technically, but did you yeah, have yeah, different I mean, challenges there? It's quite interesting, but um, yeah, so they, they can all there it, it's, it's brilliant like they go so fast it's too fast which is which you think like well that's a great problem to have but actually not if you don't have the right inputs right so what i mean by that is that they're going so fast that you can't you can't do the discovery bit well enough in time to make sure the stuff going into into their sprints is actually the, the you know you're, you're you know 80 percent sure that's the right thing to do right so so what happens is you end up with this really bloated super app with 22 different services and some of them have product market fit, some of them questionable. So, um, and then all, all the features become disjointed because all the teams are like split up and, and trying to work, you know, using this reverse Conway's way, which is great for speed, but actually that, you know, you get a different problem where, you know, I'm, I save my address over here and then I try and do something over here and I have to put my address in and it's like, what's going on? And these aren't joined up. So you get a whole new set of problems emerge, which I found really interesting um, and not expected. And, and there, yeah, we had to work through those challenges as well. So there's a question here about what's the, um, given that the teams are in Bangalore um, and are competing with some noise next door, I'm afraid, so sorry about that. Um, given that the engineering teams you mentioned were often in India, um, how could they get the context from, you know, from 
the, the different context from India to Indonesia. Did you did you actively try and get people to travel when you could do that? Yeah. So I think um, yes. Um, so they had, yeah they had to come over and before COVID you know they did come over and, and and but not that often. You'd be surprised at how much you don't need to do that if you have a really good. Um, if you have a really good process for discovery, like, like when we started using job to done, for instance, like, you know, we were so you could package the problem up that you had really good PMs, right? Some of the PMs engaged it, they could really parcel up a piece of work for an engineer. And it's just unquestionable how to implement that, you know, with the design and everything. So, you know, so that process was so well done that it was actually okay. Before, uh, when I was still at Marpan looking over the fence, the people in India were getting requirements from marketing, actually quite funny. So marketing would read something in, in, in a newspaper and say, oh my God, someone's launched this, we need to do it. And that's kind of, I was surprised, but, oh my God, that's how the roadmap's getting built. And they couldn't defend it because they were in India. They didn't know if that was the right or wrong thing. And also there were some things that they were, there was one way GoPay nearby where I could open the GoPay app and see all the merchants nearby I could pay. Why would anyone need that? <laughs> but a competitor called Paytm in um, India, uh, so not a competitor, a, a wallet, had built that and it was quite successful. I don't know how. Um, so that got in because I think that was driven by India. Hey, this works, so you should do it there. And so I think, again, that's where if you've got a good discovery process and, and you can really pass it up into very small units of, 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 uh, of engineering um, stories, tickets, it's fine. Um, but what I will say is that, you know, you should definitely try and have this kind of ceremony every six or 12 months where everyone gets together in market. Because um, that's, you know, again, if you go back to the social research I've done, that's, you know, that, that's how humanity is scaled, right? You have to get together with that peripheral um, um, a part of your organization outside that five group or your 15 you have to go and you know have a big feast and celebration and, and otherwise it, your culture starts to break down a little bit if you're too separated um but yeah yeah we, we, we remote's been great actually uh, i think it's i think it works as long as, as long as you set it up right oh that's fantastic um i think we're we've almost at time we've we've thank you very much um, maybe corey jessica any any sort of burning questions that, that you've spotted for adam and uh you can ask them so i don't compete with the choir that's <laughs> appeared <laughs> no nothing i think we've covered a lot of ground and some good questions i don't know jessica if if you have anything you you've been saving up i actually have one question that was um asked by the audience um like from Hong Kong to Indonesia to Vietnam, um, what do you actually miss the most from Hong Kong? And what do you think Hong Kong could do more to become um, more better and more in innovative in terms of the FinTech space? Hmm. I, I think what I miss is, you know, the electricity of that, you know, Hong Kong's Hong Kong, right? I mean, you can't, you know, that's very unique in terms of just, just that feel, the vibe, the smell, the lights um I, I totally miss that it's so much um you know even the sticky kind of air and everything it's just all part of the experience so i i, I miss that a lot and i definitely can't wait to come back and see friends and things and, and, and live that again um in terms of like the innovation culture i kind of from where i'm standing it looks like it's getting better like i'm seeing like mox bank that looks quite cool like i said well, that's, that's a good product and um i'm seeing you know uh, some really capable people working in some some great new companies um so I, I don't know, like when I arrived, it was pretty bad. I'll be honest, it was all the big old companies, you know, the conglomerate style companies building things like now TV and, you know, my least favorite product in the world, uh, uh, you know, and, and it was just horrible. Like everything was really bad, but like, I feel like it's just gotten so much better and it continues to improve. But yeah, I, I, that's my observation from afar. Maybe it's not like that. I, I don't know. Sorry. Maybe, maybe if if I could indulge of just one has hit me when we talked about those different markets um, to obviously Hong Kong, Indonesia, Vietnam, all non-English as a first language, but we're talking about uh, making observations about human nature and sort of inferring things from, from conversations or feedback. Obviously, you know, for, none of those, are your first language either, How, you know, just curious to roll to, to understand what role you play, like listening directly, or you, do you have do you have partners or research people that are helping you make those interpretations? Because it's all of a sudden you maybe don't get that first person inference that you might get if you're relying on that extra layer in there. Yeah, it's a great question, and I think you're absolutely right. Um, um, so I think in it's different across different companies, to be honest. But in um, in Hong Kong, maybe pay me if I can remember the experience. Um, you know, you've got to become best friends with the people who are talking to the customers because if they're talking in Cantonese, you, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, even if you try to learn it in a year or something, you, the depths of like stuff you'd miss from, you know, just not being a native. 
So, you know, I, you know, you'd make friends with the people who are talking to them and, and you, you'd make sure you'd get to the giggly stuff and you'd question all oh, what's going on there. Did he, was that a flirt or, you know, and, and, and you, you know, you'd really try and like just, just scratch at everything you saw and just try and get an explanation. And if you didn't understand it, you just got to keep asking and, and, and keep asking like the five whys to get to the depth of what's going on there. Um, but I think, um, yeah, that's just kind of Hong Kong. It's similar in Indonesia as well, like, you know, um, the, but I think uh, in terms of like the, what I tend to try and do, the social stuff, it's actually like below culture, right? So, so, so you, so you, I always, I spend a lot of time and, and I, Anthony's a great guy to talk to because of his uh, uh, educational background, but a lot of time talking about what's going on down, down below, right? Uh, that makes us all common and focusing there and building products more aimed at there because they tend to scale across geographies as well. So if you work on regional stuff, right? You don't want to try and build something for a niche culture. You want to try and stay at the level below um, and, and, and build for, you know, this, this thing can export to another market. It doesn't need, you just need to change the language, right? Um, so, so, so that means just reading a lot of books um, and, and understanding like humans, um, you know, uh, at a kind of fundamental level. And then adding that kind of cultural layer on top of it, like using those translators. And, and you know, you, you've got to put the time in. I will say like, you can't just sit there and just get a slide deck and, and, and execute. You've got to go out there and watch and observe with them. And you've got to sit in customer interviews and it's painful because it's no one likes sitting through a bunch of, it just sounds like noise if you don't know the language, um, but you've got to do it. You've got to, because there's a lot of body expression going on there. There's a lot of, you know, you miss all that if you just read a document exactly, at the end. Yeah. So, it's about putting the hours in, which is tough sometimes. <laughs> no, very good. Thank you. And uh, and certainly on behalf of uh, of the FinTech Association, thanks for taking the time. Hopefully the audience got plenty out of it tonight. And big thanks to Anthony to, to kind of framing this one up and, and driving it and bringing it home. No, no, pleasure. And thanks to the Future Foundation as well, uh, course, who yeah. joined us on this. And Adam, yeah, incredibly grateful. Always a always learn a lot when, uh, when I have a chance to chat with you. So thank you for sharing. Thanks everyone. Yeah, much appreciated. Good to be here. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.